on this computer. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. So biblical hermeneutics is what is our subject tonight. And before we get started, um, I want to show a little video about the Bible. Hermeneutics is the study of how to study the Bible basically. So you got hermeneutics and you got uh, hermeletics uh, or the the two uh, theological functions um, or ways, instructions on how to study the Bible. Very, I think it's very interesting because uh, you get more out of it. You get more out of the Bible in your study when you understand the system the Bible has set up, and we'll go over all of that. So let's look at this little video. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. It includes historical information, informative stories, poetry, philosophy, and personal letters. But above all, the Bible is the Word of God. If we had to pick one goal for the Bible, it would be to reveal God to us. There are many things about God that we would never know unless He told us. God's self-revelation to humanity is the Bible. The Bible also tells us about ourselves. It teaches us about our sin and God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. The Bible is an irreplaceable gift from God, and it is our duty not only to understand its purpose, but also to use it to further God's glory in a world in desperate need. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. One of the most thorough purpose statements found in the Bible. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes to his young assistant, Timothy, All Scripture is divine and is useful for teaching, admonishing, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that God's servant is comprehensively prepared for every good work. Many parts of the Bible are spoken directly by God, while other parts are spoken by men He guided. But it is all His Word, and it is all beneficial and authoritative. The Bible reveals the path to salvation. What's more, it will teach us, correct us when we are wrong, and train us to do what is right so that we can do God's work. We can learn more about God's nature by studying the stories in the Bible. Our human brains may never fully comprehend God, but His Word provides clues as to how God has interacted with His people over generations. Here are a few more Bible verses that speak to the Bible's own purpose in our lives. To keep us from sin, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Psalm chapter 119, verse 9. For spiritual guidance, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Psalm chapter 119, verse 105. The Bible was also written to give us an accurate account of Jesus so that we might believe in him and have eternal life. John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. To reassure the believer of his salvation, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. The Gospel message is central to the Bible. The sinful nature of man is revealed in the books of the Old Testament. We learn that a sacrifice was required to make things right with God. Jesus, God's own Son, was sent to be that sacrifice. John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. We are meant to delight in the Word of God and its purpose in our life. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. 
By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus did not only declare God's word is more important than earthly things, he also refuted Satan's temptation by quoting from the word of God. One of the Bible's purposes is to provide vital spiritual nourishment and to assist us in resisting temptation. Right after his baptism by John, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, reminding us that at last, part of his preparation for ministry came from a wilderness encounter. A wilderness experience is almost always cited as part of a quality leader's preparation. During this period, our motives are filtered, our backbone is strengthened, and our calling is made clear. The devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days to see what he would give up and how he would trust God to provide. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus did not only declare God's word is more important than earthly things, he also refuted Satan's temptation by quoting from the word of God. One of the Bible's purposes is to provide vital spiritual nourishment and to assist us in resisting temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. The Bible can help us put ourselves in context and cut through the distractions of the culture of today that would otherwise lead us away from God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Human ingenuity or willpower will not change people's lives. God's purposes are fulfilled when His word is truthfully proclaimed. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 through 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The Bible is more than just a collection of knowledgeable sayings that can be plucked from anywhere. As Christians, we can benefit from the entire Bible. The Bible is a cohesive work that must be read and studied in context so that it can be applied accurately. Christians who want to please and know God in their lives must consume God's Word on a regular basis. Those who are not believers but are curious or even skeptical about the Bible should read it for themselves to see what it is about. See what it is. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, the Bible. Okay, I want to show you some. Um, so, uh, we're talking about the Bible tonight. How uh, the construction, uh, the purpose, um, the intent, and more and more, I'm hearing the words "prepare for war." You know, get prepared for a, uh, a physical war we could have, but uh, mainly spiritual war. We are in a deep spiritual warfare. And uh, we've been talking about our kids and, and things like that and people who are just being bombarded uh, with the evils around them. So the Bible carries the information. The Bible is the book that has the information that we need to defeat the enemy. We talked about strongholds. So we, we're gathering all of this knowledge and we put it together and it's going to help us to, um, to engage in war, to engage in spiritual warfare and um, to get people saved, 
to learn how to witness, uh, to become stronger in our own faith. And uh, so all of that is contained in the word of God. So we need to fill our hearts with God's word. So I'm, I wanted to also start off with uh, what is four different scriptures. Uh, Pastor Sam, I know you're tired, but you feel like reading those? Oh, sure. Yeah. It's just the print is kind of small, but I think I can see it there. With this I new format that's coming up. Okay, Proverbs 25, I mean Proverbs 24, 5. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. Mm -hmm. And then Proverbs uh, 2, 6. Six. For the Lord give wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 18, 15. The heart of discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Isaiah 11, 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Amen. All of those scriptures were basically talking about knowledge and gaining knowledge uh, of God's word. Proverbs is a book that you should read if you are inter interested, and I'm sure all of us are, in gaining knowledge because it is filled with knowledge and wisdom. Uh -huh. uh, that is just filled with knowledge and wisdom. Amen. So also the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, fools despise it. They despise wisdom and instruction. And, and we know that, don't we? We know people who are just so foolish until when you try to um, help them through the word of God and show them God's love and God's word and how that they can move on from situations that they have encountered, a lot of times they're not interested. And uh, you see them the next time and, and, and things have happened and they could have saved themselves a little trouble if they had listened. And um, so the Bible has a lot to say about being foolish too. So a fool despises wisdom and instruction. So, all right. So hermeneutics, let me give you a definition. Biblical hermeneutics is the study of the principles and methods of interpreting the text of the Bible. And um, Pastor Sam, I know this is small, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read it because okay. I know your computer is here is acting okay second timothy 2 15 says uh commands believers rather to be involved in hermeneutics it says do your best do your best to present present yourself to god as one approved a worker who correctly handles the word of truth it says do your best and that's all god can ask of us right and that's all we can ask of ourselves. But when we're slowful and we don't study, uh, we could care, you have an attitude, we could care less. I'll do it when I get around to it kind of attitude. Then uh, that's being foolish. So we are to do our best to present ourselves to God as one approved, as one who has studied, as one who has gained the knowledge he's talked about in the word of God, a workman, a worker, a workman, it says in King James, I'm used to that translation, um, a worker who correctly handles the word of truth. So the purpose of biblical hermeneutics is to help us to know how to properly interpret, to understand, and to apply the Bible to interpret the Bible, to understand the Bible, and how to apply what we learn. So that's the purpose of uh, the study of hermeneutics, okay? 
um, I want to share three laws of studying the Bible. Okay, the most important law of biblical hermeneutics is that the Bible should be interpreted literally. Okay. We are to understand the Bible in its normal or plain meaning, unless the passage is obviously intended to be symbolic or figures of speech or employed. The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. You know, you know what I hate to hear? I hate to hear people say, I think the Lord meant this. I think, I think he meant to say, or you ever heard people say that? He has no problem saying what he means, and he means what he says. So, for example, when Jesus speaks of having fed 5,000 in Mark 8, 19, the law of hermeneutics says we should understand 5,000 literally, literally. There was a crowd of hungry people that numbered 5,000 who were fed with real bread and real fish by a miracle working savior okay we don't uh we don't bring that number down we don't take it up well maybe the bible meant um 500 instead of 5000 you know how could they feed uh 5000 people with a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread so you know in our finite mind we can't uh under God, Jesus. We lost you. See, give him a few moments to yeah, yeah, see if she'll come back. You know, they've been doing that with not just the uh, uh, internet and stuff. You know, their phones been going out they, and they yes. go out at different times. They doing this on purpose. <laughs> Sister Betty and I were talking uh, this, uh, this afternoon and all of a sudden the phone just disconnected. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I haven't had it in a landline service for over, I'm going on a week now. My landline is, you hey, can't you, dial, you can't receive call and I can't dial out. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. can it, you, it goes in and out. Can it you, goes can in they, and out. Today, today I, I can't make it out. That's why I'm on my mobile phone. Oh, okay. Can you, you all hear the hurricane? Oh, here she comes. Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Okay. All right. I was just talking. Yeah, and we know. <laughs> Pastor Sam came down here. He said, we can't hear nothing you're saying. I don't even know how far I had gotten. Had I, had, and did you hear the scriptures that we read? Yeah, the ones that Pastor Sam read, the Proverbs. Right. Is yeah, that, we heard, heard those. Okay. You were talking about the three laws. You had yeah. the first one. Okay. The first one was the Bible should be interpreted literally. Right. Okay. Did you hear the second one? No. The second. Okay. No. So that's where I lost you, I guess. Wow. I'm just flopping my lips. Okay. <laughs> they changed. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think like who was that? Drina just said. I think they're doing something to the internet. <laughs> they probably are. They're probably keying in on Christians to having Bible study and trying to interrupt us. Uh -huh. so, um, the second crucial law of biblical hermeneutics is that uh, passages must be interpreted historically, grammatically, and contextually. Interpreting a passage historically means we must seek to understand the culture, the background, and situation that uh, prompted the text in the first place. For example, when Paul writes of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ in Titus 2.13, 
the rules of grammar state that God and Savior are parallel terms, and they are both in apposition to Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul clearly uh, calls Jesus our great God. That's a, a, a that's a biggie. You know, a lot of people want to accept the Trinity, the speaks of the Trinity, uh, and said uh, Jesus stands alone, God stands alone, the Holy Spirit stands alone. Some uh, denominations don't even uh, mention the um, Holy Spirit as a person of the Godhead. Uh, denominations like apostolic, uh, they don't. They um, When you talk to them about um, the Holy Spirit, they look at the Holy Spirit as more of a force instead of a person. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead. So all of that has to be taken into consideration and uh, understood to get the, the most out of our studies. Okay, so the third law of biblical hermeneutics is that scripture is always the best interpreter of scripture. And for this reason, we always compare scripture with scripture when trying to determine the meaning of a passage. For example, Isaiah's uh, condemnation of Judah's desire to seek Egypt's help and their reliance on a stronger, a strong Calvary in Isaiah 31.1 was motivated in part by God's explicit command that his people not go to Egypt to seek horses. You have to read the story. But um, uh, scripture interprets itself. We don't have to uh, um, wonder. Also, let me let me mention this. Um, in most passages, when you are reading, especially when you get into the Gospels, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you get into some of the parables, and you don't understand what the parable means, just keep reading. Because usually in either uh, in that same passage, say if it's chapter three of, you know, of uh, John, and you're reading a parable, uh, the interpretation uh, or the um, uh, the dialogue of that uh, that parable is going to be in you know in that passage or the next chapter. So it's going to be there. Just keep reading, you know. So you'll get an interpretation of what you're reading in that scripture. Okay. So his historical and context. Uh, uh, cultural context, the setting of scripture. Uh, this is one way that we read our Bible in historical and cultural context. Okay, so that's uh, the first step of the process, ask questions about the book as a whole. So like, who is the author? Who is the audience? This is what we always should do when we start reading a book of the Bible. So the first step is to ask questions about the book as a whole. Again, like who's the author? Is it Moses in Old Testament? Is it Nehemiah? Is it Paul? You know, who is the audience? Who is it meant for? Who is the book meant for? We'll get into some more of that later. Uh, when was the book written? Why was it written? What is the purpose and theme of the book? These are great questions to ask regarding, regardless of the book's genre. So when you start to read a book or study a book and say, I'm going to study John, the book of John, which is a great place to start anyway, um, first ask those different questions. If it doesn't um, say so, at the beginning of the chapter of the beginning of that book, then look it up. Okay, but usually um, the author, especially in the New Testament, Paul is good at that, giving a greeting. 
and uh, he'll give a greeting and at the end of a salutation. In other words, he greets the people he's talking to. I'm writing this book to my dear friends in, you know, Asia, mine, I'm, you know, and uh, so there's always a clue. There's usually a clue as to who the book is meant for, who it's written for, uh, and so forth. Um, literary context, which is the style of the scripture, uh, is also taken into consideration. So the second step enables you to see how the passage you're studying fits into the larger flow of thought, okay? A particular passage, how does it fit into the whole Bible or uh the you know two or three chapters around it it usually flows most of uh the chapters kind of flow together understanding the literary context depend uh depend on the genre of the book so this is important because you would read a poetic poem differently than a historical account of king solomon so we have poetic books. We'll get into all of that. Um, we have different types, different genres. Uh, the books of history, law, uh, revelation, um, the gospels, all of those are different groups. Okay. Um, there are several genres of biblical literature and one book, of the Bible can contain different genres and even intermix them. So here's a list of seven Bible biblical genres or categories uh, and examples of them found in in the uh, in the Bible. So uh, narrative, uh, first and second Kings, uh, Samuel uh, Chronicles. Uh, books of the law, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So that's when God gave the laws to the children of Israel. Moses got the laws and, you know, God added on, gave that um, information to Moses to share with, with the children of Israel. We have the books of poetry, which are the Psalms and um, the Song of Solomon. Um, we have the book of Pro books of prophecy, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Micah, wisdom, Job, uh, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and then we got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We also have parables, which is another group, um, and those are found in Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we have letters um, such as Ephesians, uh, uh, Philemon, and uh, Titus. And we have the books of um, apocalyptic type books, uh, Revelation and Daniel. So those are different types of categories uh, that we find in the Bible. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay. Observation um, is another key to to study. Uh, our third step looks closer into the details. It is awareness of all of the data in the passage that can be used in the interpretive process. Observation is not explanation or interpretation. It's simply seeing, observation, observe. It's simply seeing the details, okay? There are things you should do during this. First, ask a lot of questions. Start with the basics, like what, when, how, where, and why, the five, okay? And move on to more detailed questions such as what are the repeated words, the phrases, or the themes 
in this passage that may emphasize a, a concept or point. Maybe ask, are there any noteworthy list? You know, uh, what is the tone of the passage? Or does the author seem to be joyful or angry or mournful, afraid? You pick all of that up as you're reading. You pick all of that up. You, you declare a certain tone. I tell you who's good for that, and that will be David when you're reading through um, pro, uh, Psalms. Because he got a lot of emotions, uh, a lot of sometimes kind of blaming God for different things or why this happened. Job does too. You know, so he, uh, he asks a lot of questions within the verses. Like, why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Oh, I know God. You're mad at me. You know, so you can like feel David's heart when he is when you read through the book of Psalm, especially. Okay. Pastor Sam, anytime you want to kick in and add something, I know this is your your baby reading through the Bible, so just uh just feel oh. free to share. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So um some more questions to ask is, are there any figures of speech that the author is using to convey a certain image or idea? Is the author comparing or contrasting uh, opposing ideas to make a point? Does the author use passive verbs or strong active verbs? Verbs describe something, right? And uh, does the author express himself by using descriptive adjectives or adverbs? So all of these things just kind of uh, take a bird's eye view if you're going to do a deep study of a certain book. Keep these things in mind as you, you know, before you proceed. You know, you might even ask yourself, why do I want to do a study on this book? Why is book, why does this book seem inter interesting to me at this time? You know, so whatever questions you need to ask to build a foundation before you go forth is always helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, write down your observations. You know, make notes of everything you see and keep rereading the passage you are studying. And don't forget to keep in mind the larger context, you know, the overall. Why is he writing this? What's going on? Okay. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament alike you will get opportunities to do this. Okay. Uh, the fourth is application. The implication of the scripture. What, what, what do I do with it? So in our fourth and final step, we the principle we discover and decide how it should be impacting our lives here and now in real life situations. Application is meant to be more than broad ideas. It should be specific uh, actions that change the way that we live. It's easy to stop with the theological principle, but now we need to ask how it impacts us us and what we should do with it amen because after all that's why we're reading it right we read it for history we read the bible for history we read the bible uh to find knowledge and salvation and we do that through jesus christ we find salvation through him and what he did so we need to uh, actually um, look into it, you know, when we read that book of John. Now, what do I do with it? How do I apply the different things that I found in the book of John to my own life? 
how how is it going to fit into my own life? So, any questions or comments? I had one comment since you just was talking about that. But today, with a person, I was looking into some Sunday school material, and we was talking about making sure that it's accurate. And mm -hmm. we was came to the conclusion that Hollywood and television are really, really twisting the scriptures around and like never before. And a lot of people are getting their theology or Bible lessons and stuff like that from Hollywood and television and other videos and that, and how they uh, take the scriptures and twist it around to make it for entertainment purposes and that, you know. There's a word that's called what they uh, they allowed to do a certain thing. What do you call that? When they can take things and change it around? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Make a movie? I don't, I, I mean, I don't know what. Well, it's some they kind of right. They have a right to do something, you know, <laughs> uh, to make it entertaining. And, and uh, you know, something, uh, this television talk, or Hollywood talk. But they are really, really hurting the Bible. They're twisting the scriptures around. You know, shows like The Chosen and all the other new Hollywood blockbuster movies. Oh, it's, it would be like a depiction, Pastor Sam. What do you call it? Depiction. Oh, right. Uh, and they they take and then they're twisting the scriptures around, and then people will go to the Bible and they see just the opposite. A good example is. When I first watched the Ten Commandments, I thought everything was basically true that was going on in, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments. You know, most one of the most watched movie out there. You know, but when you read the scriptures, it's just this. It's it's not even the same thing. And you know, when you read the Bible, when you learn how to read the Bible and study the Bible, and like you were saying, who is for, who it was written to, all that is so important. You know. You know. Uh, and yeah, that's a, a very sad commentary that people go to the movie to find and get their spiritual information rather than the word of God. But I mean, you know, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I know I, if I go to a movie, which I haven't been to in years, uh, I go to a movie to be entertained, you know. Well, that's what I mean. The Bible is. Oh, why would somebody go for spiritual knowledge? Uh -huh. Why would I go to a movie uh -huh. for spiritual knowledge when I know the word movie, or you know that that brings to mind something that's going to entertain me, you know, make me laugh or uh -huh. make me cry or whatever. But I'm I, in my mind, I know it's not true. Uh -huh. You know, so I don't know. It's kind of hard to uh, understand a person that's saying, no, I'm going to go to the movie and I'm everything I see is going to, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like it's true. Well, a, a, an guess... unsafe person will go there and be thinking that it's, you know, what he's watching is that's, something that's, that, what I said. that's what came out of the Bible. They say this is the Ten Commandments. You know, that's the name of the movie. It, that's kind of sad. So... Yeah. Hi. Okay. No, I said, I, I don't know. I said, okay, I don't know what to, you know, other than that's where we come in maybe to reach as many people as we can uh, to share the truth with them, you know, before they um, get their minds mess up, messed up with Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? I, yeah, it, it, we're, you got to have that. And um, so when you have an opportunity to share, if somebody does bring up a movie, I saw this movie and, oh, Jesus was doing so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and, you know, and it's sounding like they are looking at it as being true. Then that's your opportunity to set the record straight, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we have to do that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so you observe how the theological principle of the uh, text addresses the situation of the original audience who the writer was originally talking to how did this principle make the difference in their situation you know we're looking at it to observe how we can use it in our lives so how did the people who were who were originally addressed with that verse or chapter um you know what were their thoughts? Uh, is are there any clues how they felt? Um, 
you know, I'm thinking about, you mentioned the Ten Commandments, and, you know, I was, uh, I started thinking about when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. and how people acted when he came back, and what they were doing, mm -hmm. you know, they thought he had been gone too long, and so they had Moses, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron, his brother, who was left in charge, you know, make the golden calf, you know, so, um, there's a lot that we can learn in stories like that. You know, uh, sometimes we don't think God is on time and uh, we start foolishness and we turn our back sometimes because we don't want to wait on, you know, uh, truth to happen in our life. And so we make our own truth. And those people uh, who start worshiping, they wanted to worship something you know, and they didn't want to wait on God. So they were worshiping. They melted all of their jewelry and gold and stuff. And they made this calf. Uh, they start worshiping it. So, you know, is that the way we act? Is that, you know, uh, what did we learn from how they acted? What did God do to them? What did God say to them? You know, so that's a clue on if we ever, you know, start thinking the way that they were thinking, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and always. So the, in the anger he felt with them, it's the same anger he feels with us when we do something outside of his will or, you know, contrary. So think about situations in your life uh, or the world that may be similar or impacted by the same truth. Ask God how he would want you to apply this. Make specific applications uh, to these real life situations that answer how the theological principle should impact you in various instances. And once you know how the principle should be applied, test it to make sure it is faithful to the meaning of the text. Make sure that you are interpreting whatever that uh, text is, whatever that verse is. Uh, make sure that you are rightly dividing it. We'll talk about that. Uh, if the application is true to the meaning of the text, obey what you have learned okay and conclusion on this uh the process of hermeneutics is important for two reasons firstly it teaches us how to correctly interpret scripture and apply its truth to our lives secondly hermeneutics process helps us to grow competently uh to study god's word Acknowledge, acknowledging that, that we don't have to be biblical scholars to understand it. God has made his, his word very simple. And uh, it is our responsibility, responsibility to diligently study God's word. We must do so with humility and dependence on him as we use the hermeneutics process. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. And uh, let me ask, do any of you have a process that you use uh, that works for you in your study? Anybody want to share? How do you approach the word of God? Anybody? You know, when I get, when I don't understand the words, I oh, look them up. Very good. Very good. And that's what exactly what you do to look them up with. Them? What do you use? What, that's what, I'm sorry? What, what dictionary is very important? What dictionary <laughs> or commentary do you need to look it up? Then it tells me if, if it's all pertaining to the Bible. Okay. Because uh -huh. the word can mean more than one thing, well, yeah, but I always go with yeah. one that pertains to the Bible. Exactly. It is. It would be very good to get a 
Bible dictionary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, try to find a Bible dictionary. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Uh, a, a regular dictionary is fine if you, you know how to, like you, and it sounds like you do, how to pull that biblical definition right. out. Right, I will mean. get one. I'll order me one uh, from Am Amazon. Amazon should have one. I'll order me one from Amazon. All right. And they got Prime Day coming up. Okay. All right. <laughs> And let me recommend vines, vines for the New Testament, vines, V I N E, expository dictionary. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. That's basically the longest long long biblical dictionary, right? That is just different, uh, different writers and different uh, uh, dictionaries out there. But would it be what I'm saying? What I'm saying is, okay, if there's different biblical dictionaries out there, it says one word in both, but do would, would they have a different meaning? If that one no, word has a different meaning, some words do have more than one meaning. Okay. Uh, even in the Bi in uh, in a Bible dictionary, you might have you know a word that has more than one meaning. The good thing okay. about a Bible dictionary, it will usually give you a reference uh, to or an example. Okay, you know what I mean. So you can pretty much uh, pull that that reference or that definition out that you need to apply to the makes sense to it too at the same time yes ma'am yes. amen very good yeah especially right. and i just want to say this especially the newer dictionaries because uh different denomination and different people are printing uh dictionaries and books like that and changing their view like the united Methodists just changed their view right right and, it's and it's okay for the same two people to marry well, that's going to yeah, be. Yeah, so what I do? Okay. When I go with just the, just the what we. Yeah. I will go with us, like, or what? Not the Catholic, not the Methodist, right. not the Lutheran. No, none of that. I'll send you we'll, the New King James version. Right, we'll send you a couple of of uh, names of dictionaries. Okay. Uh, you know to make sure you get the right one. Mm -hmm. I get right. a strong one of uh, the strong concordance that you told me about, Patsy Vaughn. You get it? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. Very good. That's a concordance. Okay, just send to the email, Pastor. Okay, I'll send, send you uh, the name. Pastor Sam likes vines. It's an old... Well, old... that's a dictionary. She come, she got a concordance. Oh, strong as a concordance. I know and it is. Two she, different, was just you know. me she, got, she was just telling me she got the Concordance, I told her to get. I need the dictionary first. Right, you need because I need to understand the words. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll get it to you. Okay, all right. Uh, Second Timothy three sixteen says all scripture, all scripture. Um, somebody want to look up the word all for me as we're talking. <laughs> all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for one of what three things, four things for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So, all scripture is going to help you in one of those categories or several in one verse, actually. But it's gonna, uh, you're gonna, it's gonna help you in doctrine. It's going to help you in reproof. We're going to talk about the definitions of those. Um, correction and for instruction and in righteousness. Okay? All right. So what is doctrine? So so we we need to find out. If it's going to help us, we need to find out what those words are. Doctrine is a body of teaching. In the Bible, it is the teaching about who God is, who we are, why the world exists, and so on. So that's doctrine. That's uh, the complete word. Uh, it says it's going to help us in reproof, or it will reproof us biblically to expose or to point out sin. 
and give solution. So the Bible is going to expose our sin. When we read it and it says thou shall not and we are doing it, then we should stop. Okay, correction to set right, to set straight, to see right, to rectify, and to bring to a bring to the stand of truth. Okay, so it's gonna correct us where we've been wrong. Not necessarily a sin, but we maybe we had a wrong understanding of something. Okay, and then instruction. Something someone tells you to do is instruction. To order, ruling, to command. The goal of biblical instruction is to prepare us to handle the challenges of a world committed to the glory of man instead of the glory of God. To teach the right way. Mm -hmm. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And, th and there's your definitions on those. The entire Bible is written for us, but not every verse is addressed to us or written about us. All scripture, again, is profitable, but not. Not every passage is for our um, participation or obedience. Okay. Second Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. Work hard at presenting yourself to God as a one who is approved, who is trying, who is putting yourself out there to learn everything that you can about his word and him and you and the world and everything that he, he has to say. But we have to know how to do it. So diligence is described as thoroughness, completeness, and persistence of an action, particularly in terms of faith. It's a steady person, diligent, you're working hard, okay? Results in careful, energetic, and persistent work. So when you're diligent, nobody's gonna stop you. When you have your mind set on doing it, you're going to do it. Nobody's going to stop you. Diligent people get the job done. And that goes for everything in life. Everything in life. Diligent people don't stop until the job is done. They don't try to throw it off on somebody else. They don't have to try to justify their wrongs. But they're diligent in learning the truth, applying the truth, and working hard to make sure that they are, you know, that they are receiving the truth and walking in truth. They don't quit until they have given it their all. Any questions? Okay. Proverbs 10, 4 says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Mm. <laughs> Proverbs 13, 4 says, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. And we're told in Proverbs 4, 23, to guard and that should be our hearts with diligence because everything we do flows from the heart. Gar garbage in, garbage out, whatever we put in our heart is going to come out. It's going to come out usually in the form of our mouth. So you want good things to come out of your mouth? 
be pleasant, then put the good things in. It would be self-defeating to desire greater understanding of the Bible by cutting portion, portions of it out. A lot of people do that. A lot of people don't even bother studying the Old Testament. Some people don't bother studying the New Testament. Some people don't bother studying the book of Acts. All kind of reasonings. Oh, that was for then. This is for now. I don't think God meant for us to do that now. You hear all kind of crazy stuff. Okay, so this is not greater understanding. It is simply shrinking the Bible down to our level when we do that. God forbid we eliminate or ignore one word, one syllable or pronunciation from the complete sacred text of God's perfect word. It's not meant for us to tear the part of the Bible out that we don't like because uh, we're still participating maybe in, in a sin that it's telling us to get out of. Or we don't even read it. Maybe we don't tear it out of the Bible, but we just don't read it because every time we read it, uh, we think about the sin that we're in that we haven't given over to God yet. The whole Bible, the whole of the Bible, you know, is profitable. We just saw that scripture. Okay. So rightly dividing the word of truth is not cutting off scripture for our profit. Instead, it's like the division of a book into, it's like division of a book into its index or speech into its outline by separating the parts into their appropriate context, we are in a better position to understand the whole. Just, in other words, just understand when you're reading the Old Testament and you know it's uh, referring to the children of Israel crossing into the, you know, the land flowing with milk and honey, you know, those things are for our education, our knowledge. We understand how God works with people to bring things to pass. But we're not there. We're not in that setting, but we learn from what they went through. We learn from what, what they went through. In general, we are in the age of grace. We are in the dispensation of grace. There's been seven dispensations. We're in the next to the last. We're in grace. The next one is a uh, revelation or a consummation of the entire world. So we are in the age of grace. All of the other five dispensations have gone by and God is dealing with the people here, the church age. He's dealing with us here now. Amen. By right division, I mean acknowledging that the doctrine concern concerning the church today is found in Paul's epistles along uh, by the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in the Bible. So this dispensation given to Paul was hidden in ages past. The people in Israel, you know, the early Jews crossing into the Holy Land, crossing into the land formed with milk and honey, they had no idea about what was coming to pass many generations uh, later, uh, known as the church or Paul, or Jesus in that case. They were reading text about Jesus and didn't even know who he was or, you know, didn't have an idea who he was. And 
So that's why they uh, he came and he went and he's coming back again and they're still looking for him to come the first time. Those are the seven dispensations, the seven time periods of the world, the Bible. And you know, we have the, the time of innocence, Adam and Eve, right? Consciousness, when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, human government, you know, the kings, they wanted their own form of government, so they wanted to be like the, like the, uh, you know, people around them. They wanted a king. They wanted human government. They saw it didn't work. Uh, prop, law, church, age, um, and the kingdom, which is the last dispensation at the revelation okay how would we know sin if it were not by the law how would in those are scriptures how would we know sin if it were not by the law how would we know of impudent uh, uh, righteousness if we could not read what abraham our father um, pertaining to the flesh had found. How could we know the obedience that God requests unless we read the examples of how Israel lusted after evil things in the wilderness? Okay, so all of these things for our learning, for our learning, how will we know about sin? That's why the law was written. Okay. God said, follow these laws, you won't go wrong. He even said to put the laws right among your heart so you won't go astray. So all of these things that have already happened are for our learning. So we won't make the same mistakes, you know, uh, as the uh, children of Israel. Right division. What is gained from an understanding of right division is the proper interpretation of every verse into its dispensational context. While every book and testament is written for us, not every book and testament is written to us or about us. Remember, every scripture is profitable for something. So we're going to get something out of it, even if it wasn't addressed directly to us for that time period that dispensation we still learn every word of god is good every word of god is good any questions surely we can agree that when god told noah to build the ark he was speaking to noah and not to anyone in the 21st century right hadn't even got here yet once realizing the proper context, we can understand the limits of its application. And while we may learn the spiritual truths about Noah's righteous obedience as an example or his faithful diligence, despite being persecuted, we would be wrong to go and build an ark because since God said it, I'm supposed to obey it. God told Noah to build an ark, but he wasn't talking to us. We got it rightly divided. So he, we got to understand when we say rightly divided, in this instance, Noah building the ark, he was talking directly to Noah at that time. But there's so many things we can learn from what Noah went through before, during, and after. Because as Noah was a righteous man, we find out that, that he uh, had some trouble afterwards. Any 
It may sound silly when applying, uh, 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 applied to building an org, but many use the same reason to support applying any verse of scripture to their daily situations as if it were talking about them. We would be wise to first interpret every passage in the Bible into its dispensational context before attempting to apply its doctrine to us. Choosing not to rightly divide a passage into its dispensational context is the root of the majority of biblical misinterpretations and errors taught today. The majority of wrong teaching that we receive that's out there that we talk about all the time is because people teach things out of context. Rightly dividing allows us to understand why there are apparent contradictions in biblical doctrine. Contradictions a lot of times because of different translations that are not approved um, we used to use the NIV and we found some errors. Now, as it wasn't from God, it was from the publishers. So it's, it, um, and, and, and for the most part, they were, I'm going to say they were like jumping out on every page, but sometimes the, when things are small and you're looking at the whole and uh, you is so far so good. And so you begin to think everything is okay because, but there's the Bible calls little foxes, little things that creep in um, and that they have used or take out of uh, the Bible, uh, whole passages, right, Pastor Sand? I think whole passages of in verses. And so we found that out. So that was, um, yeah. The and, newer version of the NIV, the older version was uh, uh, fairly good, but the newer version, they took a lot of things out, a lot of scriptures and verses out. They took some things out of Marsh and on and on, you know. I won't go into detail, lack of time. But yes, it took a lot of yeah. things out of the newer versions. Mm -hmm. And the people who did the uh, translating of some of the people was working in the LGBT community also. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Everyone seems to pick and choose which verses to obey. But then would like to say in the same breath that every verse in the Bible should be obeyed. <laughs> they personally, uh, they're attempting to obey every word in the Bible outside of its dispensational context would produce contradictions too. For every, for example, concerning our, say our missionary effort, do we go to Gentile nations to preach the gospel. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 10, 5 to go not into the way of the Gentiles. But in Acts 22, uh, 21, the same Jesus tells Paul to go to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. He said, depart for I will send you for from here to the Gentiles. Now I'm gonna uh, stop and ask this question as we uh, are about to run out of time. Why do you think in Matthew, Jesus told the disciples not to go to the Gentiles, but then he tells uh, Paul to go to the Gentiles? Anybody wanna take a stab at why the two, um, and this is part of 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 um, divide rightly dividing. 
uh, I would say, I don't know if I'm right or not, but I would, I would say he told Paul to go because he had anointed and appointed Paul to go. Okay. To the Gentiles. What about the disciples? I mean, what were they? What? I don't. Oh, the Matt in Matthew ten, he said, "Go not, uh, you know, it, it, go not into the way of the Gentile." Maybe they <laughs> were prepared to go. I don't know. Maybe because they weren't as knowledgeable and didn't know how to handle the situation as well. Anyone else? I'll let you know who, who's closer. <laughs> yeah, I, I would kind of agree with that. And uh, maybe if they were going to Gentile nations, that they were going to be like um, exposing themselves or like being in a different environment that they're used to being in. And okay. so maybe like my mom was saying, they weren't prepared to be in that environment. Okay. Anyone Think else? about what Pastor Yvonne just taught him in the book of Acts. What happened in the book of Acts? Well, tell us, because we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hint. Uh, the uh, circumcision thing. No, no, the book of Acts. What, what, what was the main thing that happened? I said, Acts, well, one of the scriptures, Acts 1 8, Acts 2 38. Uh, what happened? Ah, uh, Holy Spirit. They weren't uh, baptized. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Is that it? They the weren't baptized in the Holy when Spirit. When they were filled with okay, the Holy Spirit, they, Serena kind of hit on well, it. That's they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I was saying, uh, Paul was anointed, God had anointed and appointed him to go. But the disciples, okay, you're saying they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit? No. That's not it. Well, they no, they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit, but they didn't have the um, infilling mm. of the Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit was available. He didn't come until after Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came at, well, it came at Pentecost. But the uh, disciples were, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those events were before Pentecost. Okay, but let's look at okay. Um okay. So an example of rightly divine. So Matt and those two scriptures. So what's the difference? How should we understand these two verses? Okay. All right. Surely we can not do both. Certainly the solution is obvious to any amateur Bible student. What Jesus told the disciples was not given to the Apostle Paul to obey in his ministry. The question the church should be asking is whether we follow the Lord's instruction to the 12 or the Lord's instruction to uh, the Apostle Paul. The answer is found in rightly dividing the word of truth. This is just one of the examples um, of why. If, if we are to profit from the entire Bible, it is required that we rightly divide the entire Bible. It is only by rightly dividing the word of truth that we can see with clarity God's ex, uh, eternal purpose on every page, the specific instruction to him, and the enormous profit it sows in every area of our lives. The explanation. The Gentiles were the least reached the Jews had already heard about God's grace. The disciples were not ready for cross-cultural ministry. Jews and Gentiles did not associate with each other. Entering a Gentile home would make a Jew ceremonially unclean. The Samaritans knew something of the law, but were not accepted as genuine worshipers of the God of Israel. Instead, Jesus tells his disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim 
the knowledge, uh, the kingdom of heaven, okay? Why not go to both? After all, Jesus himself went into the Samaritan and then Gentile town, uh, towns at times, right? So I don't think the disciples themselves were spiritually ready. In, in uh, Luke 9, 52 through 55, it says, but he's messengers before us. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare him. But they did not receive him because his face was, was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are, are, are of. So how quickly they reverted to their prejudices from childhood against the Samaritans. So a couple of things. Um, somebody, hit, hit, well, that was true too. They didn't have that power of the Holy Spirit uh, that Paul had. But at that time, during their ministry, they were um, the Samaritans. Samaritans and the Gentiles were the outcast, and it probably would have been some like a race riot, you know. Uh, so there were just certain places at that time that it wasn't time. And so Jesus says, do not go uh, to the, you know, the Gentiles at this time. But he told them to go to the house of Israel, in other words, to minister uh, to continue to minister to the Jews. So, um, and you can see that they wanted to call fire down on the Samaritans. So they still had some prejudice. And apparently Jesus knew this. Do you want us to call fire down on them? And so Jesus rebuked them and said, no. So, um, there is the timing. Most of all is the timing uh, 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 and the dispensation. Okay, the dispensation, the timing of the, uh, the disciples and what they were doing. And then after Pentecost and the church aid and Joyce hit it, uh, God raised up Paul, he anointed and appointed him. Um, to now it's time. And remember the, the sheet with the animals in it, you know, and because they were, they still had it in the back of their mind as well that they were not supposed to uh, go around the uncircumcised. They called them the unclean. Uh, but Jesus made it clear through the dream that Peter had, don't call anything unclean that I have clean. So that was um, as far as the food to eat and also uh, the people that they were to now minister to. So it was okay. I want you to go now. It's the time and it's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they had the power and said, the word said, you will have power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. Now mm -hmm. you have the power to go and preach to the Spirit. Amen. The Gentile, the pagans, you know. exactly, and that, and that's what they can say. This, if you can imagine a, a group of people, anybody who wasn't Jews mm -hmm. was at that time they were like the outcast. Uh, remember when Jesus went to the Samaritan woman at the well, and everybody was like, "Ooh, you know, he's talking to the Samaritan woman." You know, even asked her for a mm -hmm. drink of water from the well. Mm -hmm. You know, even exposed her life, you know, and told her everything that she had ever done and been married seven times. And man, you would ain't even your husband. You know, so he knew all of these things. But yet he ministered. He says, I'm going to talk you, tell you about some water that you that you will never thirst again. He was talking about himself. So, you know, that Jesus was showing it's time, you know, 
Jesus, you know, he, he loved everyone, but he also mm -hmm. knew that he was working with people who were, um, had still had a lot of prejudice on both, both sides. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. Now, you want me to go talk to him about you, Jesus? So it, it was a timing thing. And the readiness of the Holy Spirit that prepared Paul and, and Peter and the rest of the disciples, you know, for the church age, where God is saying, I'm breaking down all of those walls. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's one. You know, and uh, from then on out, that's the way it was supposed to be. Any questions as we close for tonight? Very good. Okay. Okay. Well, hope you got something out of it. And a um, little hermeneutics. Um, from time to time, we'll look at, you know, because it's so much to help us to um, glean all that we can for our learning and to help us to move through the, you know, the scripture and um, for all that it's worth and to get all that God meant for us to get out of it. So, Very good. Very good. My recorder off and ask Pastor Sam if he would close us out this evening. Thank you, Father 